we have our first question right down the front. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel for the great presentations. Um, a question for James. Um, I'm a producer from North Queensland, a beef producer. Um, you know, there is de degraded um, land around. Um, at what point do you knock back a client, um, a potential loan, because they might have the equity, they might have the finances to make a loan work, but they're not looking after their land? And secondly, how do you apply those frameworks to other investments that use land, like you know, mining, for example? Thank you. Look, I don't see this more about penalising industry. I see this more about valuing um, good practice. And the reality is most of the farmers we engage with are all trying to do the right thing. The, the challenge is that we don't have a way of valuing degraded land appropriately and therefore um, you know that causes all sorts of issues so potentially people because there's not transparency around the issue potentially people pay too much for it in the first place um, and then we also don't understand particularly well, well what does an investment in land rehabilitation look like and the pricing of natural capital risk is really about that and understanding that transition and so that we're much better placed to support um, clients to address some of these challenges. J James, you say it's about encouraging, which is, which is fantastic. But if this really does become ingrained and, and quite mainstream in the way we go about doing things in future, could there actually be a bit of a penalty for those who don't get on board? Look, hypothetically, yes. And, and that's the, the reality of pricing risk appropriately. Okay. Question right up the back. Um, Could you just say who you are and where yeah. you're from, please? Delene Ray from OB Organic. James, two questions. Um, the first one's easy, I think. How did you or your team get the, the powers that be at the top of NAB to agree and continue to support your team? I imagine there's always a need for money to be diverted elsewhere. Um, so how do you keep, keep them engaged? And secondly, I'm really interested to know, not everything's positive. Uh, not everyone, I would imagine, thinks natural capital is a great idea, they might think there's better things NAB should be spending their money on. Um, what, what pushback have you received, particularly from producers, like you would expect producers to embrace this, but I imagine some producers have said something else about the program, so I'm interested in your feedback about that. Maybe you've had conversations I'm not privy to, Delene. Um, look, so the, the real interest in natural capital started with the former um, chief operate, or uh, chief financial officer, Mark Joyner, um, he went along to a Prince of Wales sustainability event thinking it would be about climate change and it was actually about ecosystem degradation. And as a consequence of that, he led from the top and, and instigated NAB signing the Natural Capital Declaration. So the, the leadership really came from the top. Now, what has bought longevity and, and real interest in the business has been our ability to find tangible business links between natural capital and our day-to-day -day business. And, and they have um, really been supported most strongly by our agribusiness team. Now, when you say that, um, when Jenny says that farmers understand natural capital risk, our bankers already intuitively get this to a degree and they've been our best supporters and really championed the adoption and, and interest in natural capital along the way. Um, that said, you know, with all these things, we constantly have to justify why we're here. Um, and, you know, we think we're on the right track. The, the data from the um, Clean Energy Finance Corporation deal we've had, that's the first product we've had in the marketplace. It's been a bit of an experiment. It's available to our entire um, business bank now, adoption of that deal, 88% of it has been driven by the proactive response of our agribusiness bankers because they understand, if you re recall the customer data, they understand that it's important to our customers and that they've been able to turn up and say, hey, here's something that we think can help you out. Now, that's just the beginning and it's early days and we need to do a lot more of that if we're to continue to um, progress. But, um, you know, our chairman gave a seminal speech on uh, natural capital last year, and, and we continue to be well supported. Hmm. Peter, I, I commented after your presentation um, uh, about the, uh, uh, the common sense of it, really, I suppose, in, in actually um, 
doing this properly and making sure that we, we get better at it going forward. An enormous amount of science, but it's taken a long while to kind of get to this point of clarity. Why is that? Is, 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 is that just because it does, or does it say something about the siloed um, nature of science or the way we like to compartmentalise things and don't see the interconnections? What, what do you think? <clears throat> um, it, it's, well, it's interesting you ask the question, because when we, when we released our report in 2008, I made that assumption. I thought, oh, well, if someone just puts together a framework that everyone can agree on, we'll just go and do it. So um, eight years later, we've finally got to see the environment ministers and present what that framework might actually do in the real world. When we released the port, I went and gave a lot of presentations to business sectors, to boards and, and other business groups, and every single one of them said to me, you mean we don't do that? Then I went to the Fenner School and the ANU and some other science academies and gave exactly the same presentation, and a lot of scientists came up to me and said, that'll never work. So what, what do we have? We have the, the great thing about science, right? Everything that we now enjoy has come in some way from science, the scientific inquiry. But the scientific inquiry is based on the null hypothesis theory. Nothing is proven, all you can do is disprove. And from that process, you evolve and, and, and develop and, and create things. The downside is, though, it's very difficult for scientists to draw conclusions, definitive conclusions. So that's science. On the other side, you have practical people, farmers, who need to make decisions every single day. You have governments that need to spend taxpayers' money every single day. They need decisions made. And our problem has been connecting, which is complicated science, it is complicated, with the policy framework to get it going. So the, 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 the really positive story, Lee, is having shown what's possible has completely changed the, the policy landscape here. When people can see, oh my God, you did that with no grant from government for across the Australian regions with volunteer support, goodness gracious, imagine what we could do if we try hard enough. And so that's why it's really been a breakthrough uh, we've been able to show it's practical and affordable uh, rather than the lack of scientific knowledge in the first place. Mm. It is a, it's a great story. Now, there's a question right up the back, I think. Hi. Um, Robert Peffer, Nuffield, Australia. Uh, at risk of seeming a little bit like a Q&A audience, um, is, there's something that strikes me as very white middle class about some of this stuff, and I don't, I don't mean that in a really like a negative way. Way particularly, but I suppose what I wanted to know, particularly from Jenny, um, is do you see this, this sort of smaller scale connecting consumers with their food, do you see that as becoming the dominant paradigm for food production throughout the world or just in the West or just in places that are rich enough to afford it or is it something that will always be a small part of the market and, and we still need to be able to mass produce food uh, particularly for people that don't want to pay so much or for people of other cultures that don't uh, value, uh, don't have the same value structure in the way that they approach land. They, they might yeah, approach it quite differently. Uh, Robert, I think we need to differentiate Australians' um, food. So I, do, I don't see it's just tiny brands. I see we need to position our product, and in some ways from the meat industry, with our um, ability to trace animals and our, our food safety um, and, and lack of diseases, we've got a real opportunity to position our food internationally. So I don't see it's only tiny brands. I think it's actually at the industry level we need to look at what's our competitive advantage and how do we position ourselves uh, to, to be competitive. In the um, room before, they showed the percentage of food that we're producing. I think it was beef production, actually, compared to globally. And we're only a small sector. So uh, what we need to do is market that as efficiently as possible. And we see our neighbours, New Zealand, who's done an incredible job marketing themselves internationally. Um, we've done an incredible job feeding ourselves, and we're doing quite a good job as well. But I still think we've got some incredible advantages. But we haven't always been really effective in communicating to the rest of the world, and even to us, 
to our own market that they realise how good we are. So I'm really proud as a beef and sheep producer. I think we have some of the, I think we have the best systems in the world. I mean that's where a lot of the Chinese people are coming and wanting our systems because they know it's safe. Safe food is really really important in these countries that haven't had the systems in place and environmentally where they possibly have degraded and created problems for themselves because if we don't have clean safe food we have a big impact on our own health. So I don't see it's just a boutique thing. I think it's a real opportunity for us to position ourselves um, at industry level. Down the front. Yeah, hi there. It's uh, Alistair Hawkson from the Bureau of Meteorology. I've got a question for Peter. Um, so you've shown that the, uh, the system that you've set up already is working really nicely in the southeast Queensland catchments and um, looking to expand that um, across the country and then at a high resolutions, I suppose, is the best way to put it. So those uh, higher temporal and spatial resolutions, um, they must produce uh, data automation challenges in how you're measuring these things. So um, I suppose, you know, it, how far can you push it? Can you go down to paddock scale updated monthly or weekly and um, do those data feeds currently exist? Um, you know, asking a dangerous question for a data wonk to answer that question. Um, one thing I didn't mention at all was the role of technology that will play in environmental monitoring. Right, it, it is staggering. But even what we've demonstrated, and you're right, Lee, this could have been done in the 50s or 60s mm -hmm. or 70s with the systems we had then before computers, before satellites. We could have done it um, by just being practical. But even, even with what we've done, and I've said this to the ministers, Imagine just, we have 54 regions. Imagine you say have 10 assets. And those 10 assets have 10 data sets per each asset. Right? Just imagine how big that spreadsheet is, alone. Then you scale down to individual farms who want to do this. And I can tell you, there's no way we can satisfy the demands we're getting from the farming community and the conservation community to scale this down for practical uh, management purposes. Just imagine the data sets that are going to be created there. Sometimes I wonder whether there are enough atoms in the universe to create all this data, I've got to say. Um, so one of, the, one of the great... So you look at remote sensing with just safer biodiversity. Voice recognition software has been developed, Siri. Uh, facial recognition software. I know of uh, a program in the New England in New South Wales where they're using facial recognition technology to identify wild dogs but is also identifying all other animals that go through the camera trap. Not only does it take a photo of the wild dog, but when it recognises it, it is a wild dog, it sends it that, a photograph that they took to the farmer with a GPS locator. So just imagine what this is going to do in terms of revolutionising uh, environmental management at a farm scale and at a landscape scale. But that's a long answer. The short answer is you don't need any of that technology to do this. You can do it with the technology you have once there's an agreed discipline as the accounting standard you use for doing it. And that really was the breakthrough from our work. Now, right up the back. Oh, sorry, over there. Almost up the back. It seems like a long way from me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Richard Hare from Cotton Research. I have a statement that, and then a question. I, I guess my statement is that I'm hearing that, that this system is, on the one hand, a market access system, and on the other hand, it's a, risk, a sustainability risk management system. And I think we need to be very clear that, it, that its prime utility has to be about managing the risk of sustainable farming systems in Australia and, and not hold out hope that it's going to provide us with a premium access or a premium price in the market. So I think because a slave to two masters is a free man, and I think it become a bit schizophrenic. My question to you, Peter, is, there's, there's an emerging um, consultancy industry, in, particularly coming out of Europe, around environmental accounting standards and systems. And I'm sure you're aware of the Natural Capital Coalition and the Global Reporting Initiative and all of these other uh, wonderful schemes that are being hijacked by the accountants. I commend you for your science-based and practical approach to this. But the reality is that at some stage we are going to have to develop a global system because at the end of the day, natural capital is a global capital. How far away do you think we are from establishing a 
consistent global approach to management and uh, to measurement of environmental resources? That's a very good question, actually. So, um, Lee mentioned I, I worked for Robert Hill for six years. That was back in the 1996s, so for those of you who were born then, that's a long time ago. Um, those, ever since then, that, those questions have been asked. Uh, in that period, uh, through the Land Care Program, through the Natural Heritage Trust and all the other programs, the Land and Water Resources Audit, there has been an explosion of experiments and trials and knowledges and tests. That's that stuff. And that's why Australia really is and has been for many years at the cutting edge of natural resource management around the world, whether it be water management or soil conservation or whatever. At the other end, you're, you're dead right. At the global level, you have global institutions seeking to produce global data sets. Uh, UNEP, um, FAO, etc. Uh, all they can do is use satellites and expert assessment. I uh, think all that can do is describe in general terms the magnitude of the problem. None of that data can ever be used to inform a decision on a farm. And until we get the ability to use information to inform a decision on a farm and on every farm through the entire world, we'll be able to achieve that holy grail of feeding 10 billion people at the living standards they want forever. How long, how long away is it? I was, like you, very skeptical about the market-driven approach. Yes, you will get niche consumers. Yes, we do have the Asia century, uh, and we have a growing middle class. And yes, people like Jenny and others will profit from that. But to get transformative change will require a lot more than that. So I've been quite skeptical about that until I had a meeting last year with the NRM chairs. I call them the land care farmers. Um, I know that's not right, but you know, that's, they're, they're farmers. I was explaining the trials and saying that we want to do some farm scale tests. Um, and they looked at me and I got that strange look and I said, look, if you can manage your native vegetation, your soil, your water and your fauna, and between accounting periods where you produce your food and fibre, you haven't degraded those assets, you can rightly claim to be a sustainable farm. And I saw the faces change in the room. And so I asked them over dinner, what, what happened? Because I don't th you don't think you're going to make more money out of doing this. It's going to cost you money. So what's the motive? And they said, every single one of them said, Peter, because we just want to know. We just want to know that our land management practices are handing our land over in a better condition to what we inherited. And that's the universal value. That's what every human wants to do. And all we're trying to do, or Jenny and uh, Nab are trying to do, is provide the platform to help people make those decisions. Jenny, it was an aside at the end of your presentation, but you did touch on language. And there, there actually were. Um, differences between the three of you actually in, in, in the language you used and the way you described things. Can you tell us a little bit more about what, what you meant, Jenny? Uh, it's interesting as I was telling people that I was coming here to talk about natural capital, everyone said, what's that? And then I, when I Googled it, it was ecosystem services and they said, what's that? So <laughs> it's interesting. I do feel sometimes when we come to these places, we're sort of using wank word bingo. Um, <laughs> and it's not what the real people are using. So. Um, having a language that relates to the real people and the farmers is, is quite important, although we can change that. I, I know some of the work that Land and Water Australia was doing, they wanted riparian, which is the area around a waterway, to become a common term. Nobody knew what it was in the beginning. So we can educate mm. if it's an important term. But, uh, but I do feel if we've got, and we have got an enormous amount of farmers monitoring what they're doing, and if the bank's making decisions and if we're creating a national framework, it really makes sense that we align. When we started with Gippsland Natural and the Environment, we went to our local um, NRM bodies and we said, what do we need to do to get a tick of approval from you? You know, we could say endorsed. And they, they, they couldn't tell us. And, it was, and they felt really challenged. If we endorse you, everyone's going to come here and... It was really quite challenging. So wouldn't it be lovely if we had a system nationally that was recognised and if we could say we're improving our resources or was some benchmark that you could get a tick, uh, then it's consistent and then you get away from the greenwashing. So, um, you know, there's a real opportunity there. What, what is happening, it, it is the supply chain that's driving it at the moment and that's certainly what you're seeing in Europe 
where it's the supermarkets that will set up their own QA system and they're now building their environmental system and they're setting that up. But whether that's what we want nationally and whether they're the right things to do. So I see enormous opportunities that we should start, and it'd be lovely to start globally, but it's hard enough to get agreement across the states and even across the region. So we need something that works and we can all communicate in the same language. Last question, James, and obviously NAB's putting a fair bit of effort into this whole area. How much or how significant a part of your business do you think it's going to be in future? 90%? Oh, no. Um, look, I, I can see an increasing role for understanding natural capital risks right across our business. We And some of the trends at the global level are... Um, really interesting and one of those is the development around green bonds and we, we know that investors increasingly want to know um, what they're investing their money into and the ability to look across a, a portfolio and to understand and to be able to communicate all sorts of different types of risks to investors more clearly is going to be an increasing opportunity whether they be from infrastructure to property to, to agribusiness. Um, can only see the as technology enables that information to to grow that that more and more financial institutions will be looking to understand um, these risks. So whether we continue to call it natural capital or, or so forth, it, it it will be a part in some shape or form. And that's where I'm going to draw this session to a close this afternoon. It's been a, a really really interesting end to what's been uh, a pretty compelling day for me, and I hope for all of us in this room. Still things to come tonight, of course. The dinner is on and the Science Awards are part of that this evening. Dinner is 6.34.7. And tomorrow morning, just a quick note that um, our keynote speaker, Senator Anne Rustin, is um, likely to be uh, 10 or 15 minutes late, we're told, tomorrow morning. So we're looking at possibly about a 9.15 start. However, don't let that deter you. That just means 15 minutes more networking time. So come at the same time that you would anyway. Could you please thank for their tremendous efforts this afternoon, Peter, James and Jenny. And thank you for your time and attention. Good afternoon to you.